Now in this session we're going to be looking at the research that informs digital technologies education, particularly in Australia, but also some of the research from around the world. First, however, we're going to relook at project-based learning and explore that in a little bit more detail. Now, project-based learning is embedded within the Australian curriculum, digital technologies subject. There are expectations at each year level, but in particular for your course, years seven to 10, there is an expectation that students should be able to manage projects um, with some support from yourselves as their teachers and their peers. But by years nine and 10, they should be fully managing their projects in teams using digital tools to support that management. So project management tools to track um, different events, uh, deadlines, the general project management tools that you would see in industry. They should also use tools to coordinate their activities. These might involve shared drives or shared resource collections and collaborate with each other. And there's an expectation that that should also be done globally. Now that's difficult in some schools, but where possible, students should be given the opportunity to do wider collaboration. And that may just simply be access to resources and maybe some discussions with others on various forums internationally, or it might involve working with teams internationally, depending upon how much effort you want to put into that aspect of the curriculum. So this collaboration is also expected and one of the learning outcomes of the digital technologies curriculum. So how you frame that and how you support that will depend upon the projects that the students are undertaking and the learning that you want to achieve. Remember, collaboration is not done simply for the sake of collaboration, not just done because the curriculum says it's done. Uh, you need to do it in order to teach students how to collaborate. That's the learning outcome that is expected. Um, so you'll find various resources and approaches for collaborative team-based projects, which is the main approach used for developing collaboration. But it can also be done in other ways. But the focus is on teaching students how to effectively work in teams and to collaborate. So leadership processes, fellowship processes, how to manage teams, how to manage conflict, all of these aspects relate to collaboration. Now, in this course, I frame those skills under a heading called strategic thinking. Now, you won't find that in the curriculum. Um, you'll find it referred to project management. But in industry and in the IT industry in particular, there is quite a lot of effort around strategic thinking in terms of management processes. So essentially, they're the skills that students will need to become managers managing a project, um, managing a business. Now, we don't go into a huge amount of detail. We focus on project management because that is something that students will definitely be engaged with. But there are other skills that can come from business that we can incorporate into the digital technologies learning processes that the students engage with. So within the Australian curriculum, digital technologies, we have five main thinking skills. Com computational thinking, which is the main focus of digital technologies. Systems thinking. Design thinking, which is the main focus of the design and technology curriculum area, but is also incorporated into digital technologies. And we have strategic thinking, and then also creating preferred futures, or as I frame it, futures thinking, which is another set of skills that students have that can support their learning of digital technologies by being able to consider what may occur in the future through various approaches and techniques that we can teach them in terms of thinking skills. Approaches that they can use to think differently where people that don't have these thinking skills simply don't have the capacity to think in certain ways that we're trying to support our students in digital technologies to develop those capacities. But of course, the main focus of digital technologies 
is around creating solutions to problems or opportunities. They don't always have to be problems, um, but we tend to frame them as such. But creating solutions is the applied focus of the digital technologies curriculum. And that is very often most effectively achieved by the use of project-based learning, which are by their nature framed around creating a solution to a problem. Now, one approach that is used in industry and is supported strongly by uh, the Google company is moonshot thinking. And this is where we have students um, expand their horizons about what is possible and not be limited to conventional thinking approaches. It's also sometimes called X thinking, uh, trying to solve for X, where X is considered um, 10 or 100 or 1,000 times more, um, more involved than traditional incremental solutions. So for example, um, the driverless car. Now, while most companies were looking at um, small improvements to their car, to their vehicles around particularly safety, such as detecting if a vehicle was in the lane beside you and things of that nature, X thinking took the idea, what if we could have a car that would drive itself completely? Now, it wasn't achievable initially, but that was where the goal was set. And that's the concept of X thinking. Similarly, the idea of going to Mars and setting up a permanent Martian colony. That's X thinking. We haven't even been able to get back to the moon in the last couple of decades. So this was something that was well beyond what was conceivable around incremental prog progression in solving problems. But X thinking aims to go well, well, well and truly beyond. So some of the big X thinking products or projects being explored are um, life extension, about do we have the technology to extend life indefinitely so no one has to die? That's currently being worked on by a number of these companies. Of course, it probably won't be achieved immediately, but the outcomes from such research, from such thinking, can be things well beyond what we have expected in the past. And all of the major companies around the world, and DARPA, which is the US military research um, organization, have X thinking, moonshot thinking labs where they're looking at things that are pie in the sky. Um, so I encourage you to have a look at some of those just to get an idea of where current research and thinking is. And of course, it's difficult to replicate that for students. But what we don't want to do is limit our students thinking about what is possible. They should set out to try to achieve really, really powerful solutions. Not because necessarily they're going to do so, but someone has to, and it may be the students in your class. Every great um, theorist or practitioner or entrepreneur has sat in a classroom at one stage or another, often being demoralized and discouraged by their teachers. So having the mindset whereby you encourage students to go beyond what they consider is possible is an important part of Moonshot and X thinking. Now this leads into another general capability, which is creativity. And we want to try to foster students' creative processes. And that's really difficult in schools. Indeed, there's a fair amount of research showing that we actually stifle creativity in our schooling systems. Um, through our conformity expectations and through the expectations around assessment, which tend to penalize uh, risk-taking. And risk-taking is an essential component of creativity. To be creative, you have to take risks and go beyond what the norm is and beyond what current expectations are. And we don't do that well at all in schools. So wherever possible, in your assessment processes in particular, which tend to be the main driver of stifling creativity. You should give opportunities to reward students for trying out ideas, exploring new ideas, and not necessarily achieving them. Um, part of this can also be built into the design cycle, whereby students are encouraged to fail the first time through and to learn from that failure and to be rewarded 
for articulating what they have learnt from that initial failure. So a student that plays it safe doesn't try to be creative and expand their boundaries, won't achieve marks, and will be penalised for not trying to be creative and entrepreneurial and exploratory. Now, there are various techniques that we have for enhancing creativity. These are just a couple of the strategies that are used commonly in schools. Um, the six hat thinking, where we take different perspectives on problems. Um, brainstorming, brain writing, where we write creatively. Uh, thinking outside the box, uh, using SWOT analysis. And there's also a technique that came from um, the Soviet Union called TRIZ, which was actually a very formalized process to ensure creativity would occur. Um, it's quite complex, but I'll let you explore that if you really wish to. Um, but these are all approaches that we can use in schools to encourage creativity. And we shouldn't see creativity simply as an inherent ability. It is something that can be taught and developed. Certainly there are aspects of creativity that um, can come from outside the school, where it's been encouraged prior to them coming into the school environment. But within school, we have a responsibility to actually support student creative thinking and to develop that. And this leads into an area called entrepreneurship. And it's again an area that we don't support well within um, the curriculum. Entrepreneurial thinking is quite different to normal thinking. Someone who has an entrepreneurial thinking mindset thinks about problems very differently to how everyday people think about problems. Generally, when we think about solving a problem, we think, okay, there's the problem. Now, what do I need to have or resources do I need to get or things I need to um, put together in order to solve that problem? Entrepreneurs don't think about problems that way. What they do is they look at what they currently have, the resources they have, the access to human capital that they have, their friends, um, ability to hire people, ability to bring people on board into their teams. And then they look at, okay, what problems are now solvable with the resources available? And that's quite a different approach. And it's also not an approach we generally encourage in our school system. We tend to frame problems and we tend to frame them around the resources that are limited for the students to have access to them. But we rarely encourage students to go outside of those constraints, seeking assistance from outside. Um, that's often frowned upon. Um, hiring people to assist them in doing their assessment task is definitely frowned upon. Um, hiring some programmers from a company in India to help them do a bit of coding that they can't do themselves is frowned upon. But that's an essential component of entrepreneurship. And there's nothing that says we couldn't incorporate those capabilities within our schooling system. Certainly, students need to be acknowledged for their contribution and their ability to bring together entrepreneurial um, resources can be acknowledged in different ways. But they shouldn't necessarily be penalized for doing so, where we currently do. And so we actually limit students' ability to develop entrepreneurial thinking capacity. And of course, entrepreneurialship is seen as a very significant driver in our future economy. So we need to find ways of actually supporting entrepreneurship. There is work happening in curriculum circles to develop entrepreneurship into the curriculum. It hasn't happened yet, but certainly in the next sort of decade, we should see significant changes happening into the curriculum that support and encourage entrepreneurship and teach entrepreneurship. So back to project-based learning, someone with an entrepreneurial perspective looks at what they frame as what's called entrepreneurial capital. These are the existing capacities that they have, what they know they can do, what programming skills they have, what databases they know they've created in the past. They look at what they can do collaboratively. So it's not necessarily just what they can do. They'll seek out team members that support um, what they want to try to achieve. So generally, entrepreneurs won't seek out people the same as themselves. They'll look for someone that's really good, say, at graphics, someone that's really good at programming. They may be good at the business and managerial side of things, as we see often in the case with many of our high-profile entrepreneurs. They tend to not do most of the technical stuff themselves. They found friends or colleagues and 
employees that had those um, technical skills. And their skill was um, recognizing the capacity of bringing these things together. They can also outsource and bring in um, resources that most groups wouldn't think to do so. And they can also, only when those avenues are exhausted, will they consider building new capacity in themselves, learning something new, um, building new um, inherent capacity. Wherever possible, they'll use their existing collaborative and outsourced resources because that's much more efficient and effective. Now, that also has some challenges around our teaching processes because we assume that everything will be done by our students and the focus is on creating that new capacity. Um, but that's not necessarily how entrepreneurs see education. Then we get into an area called futures thinking. Now, futures thinking is about trying to position our thought processes, not so much around the problem as it exists for us now, but what the world will be like in 10, 25 years time and how our solution will fit into that world. Um, often we start with our selection of the problem and one of the ways of doing that effectively is to look at some of the big picture problems that exist in the world. Um, things such as clean water, which we know is going to become more and more scarce, the rich and poor gap, the globalization and the convergence of IT around the globe, um, the status of women and how that's changing around the world or not as much as we would like. Um, energy scarcity. Lots of these big picture ideas. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that the students are going to go out and try to solve these on a global basis. But all of these problems can exist locally as well. Whether or not the girls have full access to being in the local sporting teams or not. Are they have, do they have full access in the local computer gaming club? Um, these things can be then addressed at a local level, even though they are global issues. And there are a range of what we call trends that students can explore. Now, these are just a series of different trend sets that have been examined. But a trend is something that's been happening in the past and is likely to continue into the future. And what we do with that is we create forecasts. We start looking at, OK, if these things keep happening, what is the world going to be like into the future? We can then start making predictions about what is going to happen if these forecasts continue. So let's take a forecast around education, and it may be a trend towards increasing online education. Um, and let's say we're seeing that happening in the tertiary sector at universities. Well, a general forecast would be that other trends that have happened at university level have eventually made their way into the K-12 space. So what we're currently seeing happening at universities, we should see mirrored in the K-12 space eventually. And so that could be a forecast made about what's likely to happen, say, in 10 years' time in school-based education. So these are things that we can start doing around trends and forecasts. And from this, we can start developing scenarios, uh, predictions of if various trends and forecasts can um, eventuate, what would the world be like? And often we get students to write about these. Um, so they're based in fact, they're based in research around existing trends and about the forecasts from those trends, but then we create stories or narratives about what the world will be like if those forecasts eventuate. And from that, we then look at, okay, if these things happen, the world's going to be a certain state. What we'd like to have though, is that world be in our preferred futures state. So what do we have to then do to change our trends and our forecasts to see our preferred future come about. And this is called backcasting, where we step back from our preferred future and we look at what things need to happen in the world for this preferred future to come about. And this starts then giving us some 
ideas around solutions to, um, or problems to solve in order to see that future come about. And that's what we call um, preferred futures. So it's a reasonably complex process, but I've given you some resources on the course website to assist you in learning more about uh, futures thinking and going through some of that processes. Okay, back to research. One common prediction and forecasting we often look at is what's going to happen in schools. What will school education be like in 2030, for example? And we start trying to make some predictions. We gather some data and that helps us develop trends. And then we start making some forecasts about what those trend data might mean. So here's an example. If we looked at 2015 and 2016, the trend would have been going up very, very strongly. It's plateaued a fair bit, but we can still see that there is a boom in the number of primary school students compared to pre-2015. And this is having a big impact on universities, um, because there's a surge of students coming through that are increasing the number of um, university students, and also has an impact upon uh, school planning, need to make sure we have enough schools built to support these population changes and demographical changes and so forth. Um, in Queensland schools, we recently had a surge when we changed from um, uh, um, grade six to grade, or sorry, grade seven being coming part of high school instead of being part of primary school. And that created a, a, a bubble effect of increased number of students in that year level going through and impacting upon universities um, in around 2023-24. So these are things that are happening. There's also demographics around teachers. Um, currently seeing quite a teacher shortage happening globally. Um, and there's a lot of predictions and forecasts being made around the impact of this teacher shortage. Oops. Uh, this just shows a breakdown demographically of where the surges in student population are. And we can see the main surges are going to be in Western Australia, Queensland and New South Wales in particular, and a bit or in, and in Victoria. But not so much in the Northern Territory, in Tasmania and in South Australia. So one aspect of trends and predictions is we need to make sure that they're understood enough that they don't give a distorted view. If we just took the overall trend, then Tasmanian schools might suddenly see, oh, we have to double the number of schools we have. And that may not necessarily be the case because the data is hiding their trend data in an overall picture if we just look at the data as Australia overall. And this can happen when we look at, in particular at global data, which doesn't necessarily flow through to every nation equally. It also doesn't necessarily in schools flow through to every subject equally. As I said, um, we've got a shortage of teachers, but that shortage isn't necessarily equally distributed. Yes, there's a big shortage of geography and IT computing teachers, but not so much of a shortage in biology and chemistry teachers. So again, just looking at the averages uh, wouldn't necessarily give a accurate view of shortages overall. Um, generally, there's uh, a, not a shortage in primary school teachers, but there is generally a shortage in secondary school teachers. Um, but again, that can change in different areas and in different demographical locations as well. Oh, and that's just showing a, um, the balance in gender. Um, we're seeing an increased number of women um, in the teaching profession and the number of males are decreasing. Now, despite efforts to try to address that, there is an ongoing trend in this relationship and how that might impact upon the teaching workforce into the future is something that could also be conjectured and explored. But again, it's also needs to be unpacked in terms of individual subjects. Um, the balance is quite um, pronounced in the physics subject, but in low and special needs, there are far more women. Um, sorry, in physics, there are um, many more men than women, 
So the gender balance is skewed towards males, whereas in load and special needs in English, the gender balance is skewed very much towards females. So again, you can't just take an overall trend and make predictions. You need to delve into it in more detail. And this is all part of what we call futures thinking. So when students come to solve problems, they need to think about the world as they would like to see it, look at the trends and predictions around how that's happening, and contextualize the problem that they're going to try to solve within that greater understanding. And this then gives us our final, our next thinking, uh, thinking skill, which is systems thinking. Now, systems thinking is, again, something that many people don't have. Um, but those that do can see the world and address problems in a way that those that don't have a systems thinking capability can't. Most people think in terms of event oriented thinking. There are certain causes and effect. Um, a couple of things happen and they result in other things happening. However, systems thinking doesn't look that way. They look at everything being interconnected and how different things impact upon other things in different ways and different amounts. And it's a much more complex and nuanced interaction. So you can't just say something impacts upon something else. It, there's a whole, fact, whole range of factors that impact upon things, sometimes positively, sometimes negatively. And the overall interactions are what are important around understanding the system as a whole. One of the tools we use to unpack and develop systems thinking is what's called stock flow models. Um, in this case, this is around uh, chickens um, and eggs and crossing roads, building upon the old joke of which came first, the chicken or the egg, or why did the chicken cross the road and so forth. Uh, but here we see that the number of chickens is dependent upon the number of eggs, but it's also dependent upon the number of chickens being run over. Um, but the more chickens there are, then the more eggs there'll be. And that's called a reinforcing cycle. So as we have more chickens, we should see more and more eggs. However, if there are more chickens being run over than there are chickens being hatched, then we'll see a what's called a balancing cycle, um, where we'll see a reduction in the number of chickens. Well, it actually will balance so that if there are then too few chickens, then there won't be as many being run over because there won't be as many chickens crossing the road. And if there's enough eggs being hatched, then that will then rebalance and it will become cyclical, where it will go up and down rather than just running out of chickens. So again, there are some resources in the course website to understand stock flow models in more detail. It's not co commonly used in digital technologies, but it's certainly an approach that can be used to teaching systems thinking, um, which is not well developed within the curriculum. Another simple approach we can use instead of using the stock flow model is what is called connection circles. Now to create a connection circle, we put all the significant uh, factors around the outside of a circle. And then we draw lines between those factors, um, indicating whether or not they have an effect. So fat consumption um, can have an effect on concerns about health risks. The number of McDonald's restaurants there are has an effect upon the number of French fries sold. And this can be developed into more and more connections. And then eventually we develop what are called loops. And so we, here we can see a loop where the number of McDonald's restaurants there are impacts upon the number of French fries that are sold, which impacts upon the profits being made, which can impact upon the number of McDonald's restaurants there are. Of course, the more profits, the more likely there'll be an increase in the number of McDonald's restaurants. Um, and we can then build out from those circles what are these what are these loops, which are the, similar to the loops we saw in the stock flow diagram? Where well, we have in, on the left a reinforcing loop, where the more French fries there are, the more profits, the more restaurants, which result in more French fries being sold, and that continues increasing. Whereas on the right hand side, the, we have a balancing loop, where the more French fries that there are sold, the more French fries are eaten, but that in, increases the fat consumption, which increases health concerns, which can actually decrease the number of French fries being sold. And so then we can see an oscillating balancing 
um, loop occurring. And these can be, become quite complex. This is a um, connection circle diagram for a learning system at a university. And we can see various interactions between all the different complex elements. And this can let us into what are called simulations, where we can then simulate a particular environment. In the previous example, it was simulating a university environment. And we can then change certain variables, such as, say, the, the length of the semester, or the frequency of the assessment, the difficulty of the assessment, uh, the number of students being enrolled, the um, cutoff scores for students to enroll in competitive enrollments. Um, and these can then be simulated by the computers and we can explore different issues. Likewise, in education, there are various simulations that students can get access to and explore the role of simulations in understanding the future. And indeed, they can create their own simulations. Uh, SimCity is a, a relatively simple simulation at its heart. Uh, there's roller coaster simulations, physics simulations, dozens and dozens and dozens of different simulations that can be um, explored and students can look at creating their own particularly if they're built upon systems thinking, which can make a simulation very interactive and, um, and reflecting real life processes in terms of the changes that are made and the impacts they have on the system overall. Okay, so back to research. One of the key aspects of digital technologies is the development of computational thinking. And this is something that's quite new to most people. Um, I'll let you look at those video clips yourself. But computational thinking, essentially, this is the definition from the curriculum, or one of them. There's actually four definitions within the curriculum. Um, but it's a problem-solving strategy or problem-solving method that involves various techniques and strategies that can be implemented by digital systems. And the techniques and strategies may include organizing data logically, breaking down problems into parts, defining abstract concepts and designing and using algorithms, patterns and models. Now that's a particular approach to computational thinking um, that focuses on problem solving. But there are other ways of looking at computational thinking and more um, complex and nuanced approaches that can potentially lead to greater outcomes from students. Um, one of the first to explore computational thinking was a Professor Papert, um, who examined computational thinking and also developed essentially the, the idea of project-based learning. Um, and his work, particularly around Mindstorms, um, which was then taken up by, he worked with Lego, and they developed the Lego Robotics Mindstorm system as a way of supporting um, student learning uh, through the use of construction and um, thinking about computers and technology quite different to how we see our thinking when it's focused around simply being problem solving techniques. So his view of computational thinking was is that we use it to forge new ideas and that it's a in a sense it's a dialogue a mental dialogue between the learner and the computer where the student is trying to understand the computer, but they're also trying to understand how the computer interacts with, with them. And it's much more of a relationship between the technology and the person learning about the technology than it is simply being a set of problem-solving techniques. Um, now, an example I give around computational thinking is... Um, business education. I've taught computing many, many years in schools and often taught alongside business education, edu educators who are often teaching elements of computing. Um, they tend to focus on teaching about software applications, business software applications. So it might be Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel, um, things of that nature. Now, they come of a, from a mindset that hasn't explored computational thinking. So when they look at a problem, they look at the existing opportunities within the technology to address that problem. Um, they'll look at the help guides, the menu options, and so forth, and they'll look to see how that problem can be solved with the tool. But they'll have very little understanding of the tool itself. 
So very often they would have problems with, say, formatting in Microsoft Word. Many people have problems with that. And they can't solve it. They simply don't have the thinking processes to try to address that problem. Um, there's no menu option to solve it. There's no um, simple option in the help guide to address the issue. And so they don't have the capacity to try to come up with a solution to why their formatting is all over the place. However, from my own perspective, when I was in university learning computing, um, one of the tasks we were set was to write a simple word processor, which was simply like HTML, putting tags around things to make things bold and to um, space uh, words out and tab, put tabs in and things like that. And so at a fundamental level, I understand how the formatting is occurring within a piece of software. Now, I spend nowhere near as much time teaching and understanding Microsoft Word as these teachers. They teach every single option within Microsoft Word, and they know it backwards and forwards. Far, far more detail than I possibly ever would want to. But they couldn't solve a simple problem around formatting, whereas I could come to that problem and immediately see solutions to that and ways to address the formatting, to remove the tags or adjust the tags to address that simply because I had a, a much more in-depth understanding of computational processes than they had. And that's an example of computational thinking. What we want to instill in our students, an in-depth understanding and familiarity with technology so that they can address and see problems with the technology and solve them because of that capacity. And yes, it involves understanding decomposition and uh, generalization and abstraction and, and these skills, but the skills lead towards the capacity towards computational thinking. They're not the capacity in themselves. It's their familiarity and their confidence and their um, engagement with technology. That's what we want to foster. Backed up by various skills and capacities, but it's much more their attitude around computational thinking than the skill sets that's going to give them the greatest level of success. Um, yes, and so there's just some other things, some other quotes from Seymour Papert around computational thinking. Um, when we first come, to, uh, we want to encourage students first to use the technology and to be engaged and immersed with the technology. And through that, they then gain an understanding. Um, and it's not that we teach them stuff first. We don't teach them how to do all the different options in Microsoft Word. Or indeed, we don't necessarily teach them all the commands in a programming language. We teach them enough to start engaging with that tool and exploring it, building solutions, slowly adding to that over time, building on their capacity. And one of his sayings was around projects before the problems, where we start a project and we look for the problem as part of the project. We don't start with the problem, which is what problem-based learning is focused on. We start with the project and the part of the project is identifying a problem to solve. And that may be just as an important step in the project and students may learn just as much, if not more from that process than from actually solving the problem. Okay, now the other aspects he looks at is around, um, he was very much around manipulation, where much of the teaching at the time, and indeed now, involves students writing out things on paper and defining it carefully. He was much more around play-based learning, getting students to get in and start using the technology and trying it and learning as they go, rather than spending all of their time in preparation and then defining and specifying and flowcharting and doing it all. He'd much rather have students jump straight in, make lots of mistakes and learn from that process, then learn everything first and then try to apply it. Okay, back to the curriculum though. Um, the key concepts around computational thinking in the curriculum are abstraction data collection around the data properties the sources of data and the collection of data data representation how it can be used with different symbol sets 
um, and how we can separate different types of data. Um, data interpretation, where we look for patterns and context in the data. Um, how we specify problems um, in terms of descriptions and techniques for solving them. Um, the algorithms that we develop for solving problems. Um, how we implement problems around translation and programming. The various digital systems that students will need to use and understand, particularly around software and networks and the internet, and the interaction they have with others and with, with people and with the digital systems themselves. So that then also finally leads into the potential impacts upon the technology, um, particularly around sustainment and empowerment with that technology. So these are various attempts to conceptualize the various skills that are part of computational thinking. And that as we develop this, these skills, computational thinking will hopefully emerge. And that's what the curriculum aims to achieve. Okay, now we also have the general capabilities. Um, we have the ICT general capability, which should be renamed the digital literacy general capability. Um, but currently it's still called the ICT general capability. Um, and essentially it's different to the digital technologies curriculum in that it is focused on learning how to use things versus how to create with things. In digital technologies, the focus is on creating solutions to problems. In the ICT general capability, the digital literacy, it is much more around how to use technology, how to use Microsoft Word, how to use Microsoft Excel or uh, a spreadsheeting program, um, how to create a video, how to um, use some data logging technology in science. And these are the responsibility of all learning areas, health and PE, science, geography, history. If they want to have students do something around their use of ICT, they need to teach it themselves. It is not the job of digital technologies to teach students um, ICT general capability capacities. Um, and as with all the general capabilities, it's the responsibility of every subject to develop these capacities within students around investigating of ICT, communicating of ICT, creating of ICT, managing and operating ICT, and ethical and social practices and so forth. That said, it's also the responsibility of the digital technologies curriculum. Just as it's the responsibilities of maths and science, it's also the responsibility of digital technologies, but it's not the sole responsibility. So if we want students to be able to use a video camera as part of a uh, robotics kit that we want them to use, then we need to teach them about video editing and things like that as part of um, their capability or their general capability. Okay, so I mentioned before the concept of abstraction. Now this is one of the concepts that is part of computational thinking. And it's one that many students have some difficulty with. So at the top of this ladder, we call ladder of abstraction, we have things that are really abstract. And they then move towards becoming more and more concrete. So for example, um, my copy of To Kill a Mockingbird is very, very concrete. It just belongs to me. It's specific just to me. It's a specific entity that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. So it's pretty concrete. Somewhat more abstract from that are all the copies of To Kill a Mockingbird. Now, there's many, many copies of that. So it is more abstract. It's more generalized. There's also a whole lot of prize-winning novels of which To Kill a Mockingbird is just one. And that's a much larger set it's also, though, then part of an even larger set of novels, which is part of an even larger set of books, which is part of an even larger set of publications, which is part of an even larger set of information. Now, abstraction is actually the most powerful concept that has emerged in computing. And it's the reason why computing and the computing industry has been so successful particularly around the internet. Now, to give some examples of that, um, Facebook was originally quite concrete. It was developed at one university 
to have photos of one particular graduating class that people could then rate um, those students upon a, a scale and make comments on that. And it wasn't of any use to any other university. Of course, it was uh, concrete to just that one instance. They then made it a little bit more abstract by then making it so that it could be used amongst five universities. And it was then a little bit more generalized. The insight, though, that has made Facebook so powerful and now dominating social media is that it could be more generalized even further. Of course, it was a very simple program. But because it could then be generalized and it could then be used amongst any university where they could um, put up um, links to one another and make comments and share comments to one another. And the further insight that then made it into a multi-billion dollar industry was that it could be generalized beyond universities where anyone could make a post on anything and others could make comments on that post. Now, it all started with a very, very concrete idea and a very concrete application. But it was then abstracted. Now, wherever possible, we want our students to also do that when they come up with solutions to problems. So they may come up with a solution, say they're making an app, and it's an app that's going to solve the parking problems in the senior school car park where there's too many senior school students and not enough car spaces. So they've made an app that can allow them to um, pre-book a car space within the car park. And that's a great app for that one school, but then it can be abstracted so it could be used in any school. And maybe then abstracted further so it could be used by teachers and also students. But it's then not a particularly difficult abstraction to think, okay, maybe it could be used in shopping centers. Maybe it could now be used for anything that we need to manage scarce resources. Maybe it could be used in a movie theater to pre-book uh, spaces in a movie theater. Maybe it could be used in a hospital. And, the, and that's where a simple concrete um, solution to a problem, abstracted, becomes incredibly powerful. Likewise, when we come up with very simple um, modules or procedures, if we have a simple procedure that does a sort and finds um, how many car parks are spare, that little procedure can be abstracted so that it could be used not just for sorting cars, but it could be used for sorting um, ice creams or it could be used for sorting anything. And so that simple little procedure designed to solve an, a concrete problem can now be abstracted and generalized and become powerful enough to be used in billions of different applications. And that's the power of abstraction and the power of, comp of the computing industry. Once upon a time, computer, computer programs were written for a single computer, for a single problem, for a single task and organization, and they were never used anywhere else. What has changed and revolutionized the computing industry and made it more powerful than most other industries is this concept of abstraction and generalization, particularly because there is not the replicability and the low cost replicability of digital resources, where we can share an abstracted solution without any additional cost. We can make 100,000 copies of our solution that can be applied in different circumstances without any real additional effort or cost. And that's a really big change from how most industries have had to operate. Okay, so that's a bit of an overview of abstraction. And again, there are notes about that. But abstraction can be applied in other areas, um, can also be applied in art. So here we see a more simplification made so that our diagram is an abstraction and then it can represent more and more telescopes. So not just that one particular telescope, but now our simplified icon of a telescope can be used to, in a generalized way, 
to represent every telescope. Oops. Other things that we teach within computing, um, binary is another concept, but binary is another example of abstraction. Well, programming languages are an example of abstraction. Binary is, an ab is a, um, a more generalized way of understanding switches. Switches in transistors are either turned on or off, depending upon whether or not they have a current going through them and so forth. Binary is an abstraction of those physical switches. Machine code is an abstraction of binary, of binary commands, where in machine code, instead of having a whole lot of zeros and ones, we have simple text-based commands that represent what those binary um, switches represent. And programming code is generally an abstraction of machine code, where instead of having um, a whole series of machine code um, commands that act upon the physical elements of the computer, we can abstract those into more understandable um, commands. And then we can abstract our, our text-based commands into graphical commands for our graphical icon-based programming languages, our block-based languages, which are simply using images as abstractions for the text-based commands. So these are, again, examples of abstraction. But we have other ways of communicating. When we teach about binary, it's a way that our we use to understand how computers um, talk to one another. But there are other languages and other ways of communicating. Semaphore is communication with flags. Very similar to binary, but a little bit more complex. Uh, whoops. We also have sign language and braille, which are other forms of abstracted communication. And within binary, we have hexadecimal and decimal um, formats. And so when we're teaching about binary, we often just teach about binary's conversion into decimal or into ASCII. Um, but we can also look at conversion into hexadecimal and other forms of abstracted ways of representing binary numbers. But what we're teaching about is abstraction. We're not really teaching about binary. Yes, binary is an interesting thing to know about, but it's not really that applied. But the concept of abstraction is very applied, and students are going to use that all the time as they develop their capacity around computational thinking. But of course, we can then apply that to images, and bitmaps are simply um, a sequences of binary um, that can represent images. In this case, simple emoticons, but they also apply to um, all bitmapped images. And we can teach then about resolution and how we can increase the resolution of computer games by increasing the number of bits that represent a particular um, image on a screen. So I talked a bit before about abstraction, and this is where we see the abstraction of um, text-based programming into block-based programming. Simply as a way of helping our, us understand things because um, the amount of information contained in the text can be reduced when it's placed into a block-based image because of the relationship between the objects can provide additional information. And we can go beyond block-based to icon-based programming, which doesn't involve any text at all. And it's simply using icons and how they're connected together represent the programming involved. Okay, so part of becoming a digital technologies teacher is understanding digital technologies and how they're impacting upon education. Now, every year there is a report produced that summarizes the main technological advances happening. It's been a little bit disrupted over the last couple of years because of the pandemic, but I want you to have a look at uh, some of these reports because they give an overview of 
the predictions about what technologies are going to have a big impact upon, in this case, K-12, over the next few years. So about five years ago, um, coding as a literacy was predicted to become important, and that's ended up being so. Uh, the rise of STEM learning, or STEAM learning, where we integrate maths and engineering and technology together and science, um, is happening, but not quite as wide spread as was predicted. Um, an increasing focus on measuring learning has certainly been occurring. The redesign of learning spaces has certainly been occurring, where we're now having much more open learning spaces and student-centered learning spaces which aren't dominated by teachers. And long-term, advances in the cultures of innovation and deeper learning approaches are still really to eventuate, but people are talking about them. But they were certainly disrupted by the pandemic so these predictions are based around three different types of problems. Solvable problems are ones that we know how to solve, we just haven't solved them yet. Difficult problems are ones that we, we're pretty sure we know how to solve, um, but we're not quite certain exactly how much effort is going to be involved yet in doing so and exactly how to go about them. But we're pretty sure that we'll be able to solve them. And then there are wicked problems. These are ones that we're not sure we, we can solve. Um, we'd really like to solve them, but we don't know even how to really start solving them. And these are things such as the achievement gap between um, rich and poor students, um, sustaining innovations through leadership changes. These are things we've been trying to solve for a long time, but haven't really made any real advances. While looking at the role of teachers in schools and teaching about computational thinking, while difficult, we're, we're working towards those. We, we think we can work out how to solve those problems. And then more simple ones, such as improving digital literacy and authentic learning experiences, we know how to solve those. We just have to take the effort to solve them. And then the third aspect of these predictions is looking at the technologies that are going to be appearing in, on the horizon. Uh, maker spaces in schools, robotics, analytics technology, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and the Internet of Things were the main predictions five years ago. Okay, so then I've given you a whole lot of other um, examples here that you can go through and have a look at that just represent the significant changes that were considered and some of the implications of those changes. Okay, last couple of documents I'd like you to read through before the tutorial. There's some research policy documents which set out the what K to what's happening in K to twelve computer science education um, internationally and within Australia. So it's just just browse through them, but just to get an idea of what's happening with computer education. I know at the moment you're focused much more tightly on yourself becoming a classroom teacher and engaged with um, the requirements of being a digital technologies teacher. But over time, you're going to want to go beyond that. And having an understanding that these research, that this research is happening and that it's informing what's happening in K-12 computer education will help you become a leader in computer education over time. Uh, and there's also various research that's around teaching uh, computer education. And again, it's not something you necessarily have to engage with a lot as a pre-service teacher or even as a beginning teacher. But certainly as you mature as a teacher and after your first five years, you'll want to start looking at what changes have been occurring and what research is happening in education so that you can continue to improve. Um, in teacher education, we're going to give you the capacity to improve for the first five years or so. But after that, it's really going to come down to yourself. And you're going to be responsible for your own professional learning. And you need to be able to access these sort of resources to continue your learning journey. And the final document I've just given you is um, linked to some referencing tools so that you can ensure that your referencing is correct 
for your assignments. Okay, so that's it for looking at the research focus uh, for digital technologies education. And I look forward to seeing you in the tutorials.